know that. The world needs to know that. And I'm very grateful for leadership on both sides for making that clear to the world and to Israel's enemies. With that, I yield back. Gentleman from Texas, yield back his time. Gentleman from California. Yes, Madam Speaker, I yield myself uh, such time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, we've had a, a group of speakers come down to the floor, including the majority leader, uh, the Democratic whip, the chair of the committee, and, and a number of other members to talk about our solidarity with Israel, the U.S.-Israel relationship, the bipartisan nature of it. To the extent there was an implication, which I heard in the last speaker, that this is not a view shared by this administration, I just want to rise and indicate how wrong such an implication is. Uh, the President of the United States has indicated that these bonds are unbreakable. He has, risen, he has raised the level of security, cooperation, and intelligence sharing to unprecedentedly high levels between the United States and Israel. He is leading the international effort uh, to, uh, to get Iran to abandon its nuclear weapons program. He has stood with Israel in the wake of the Goldstone Report, in the wake of efforts in the Human Rights uh, Commission to uh, demonize and delegitimize Israel, and in the context of vetoing resolutions which unfairly single out Israel uh, on a number of issues. Uh, any implication to the contrary is unfounded and uh, seeks to undercut the very uh, the very bipartisan uh, uh, nature of the support that is so essential to this relationship. And with that, I uh, I yield back. Do you, does the gentleman reserve, have any more speakers? If I could reserve the right to close, yes, the so gentleman. Yes, I will yield the, back the remainder of my time. Gentleman from California yields back the balance of his time. The gentlelady from Florida. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I yield myself the remaining time. And I thank uh, my good friend recognized. from California, Mr. Berman, for, uh, uh, for his leadership role in, in bringing this bill uh, to the floor today. I thank uh, uh, our uh, majority leader, Mr. Cantor, as well as the minority whip, Mr. Mr. Hoyer. Uh, this bill before us, Madam Speaker, the United States-Israel Enhanced Security Cooperation Act, is an important one. It sends a clear signal and a clear message throughout the world to our friends and to our enemies that the United States stands four square with our indispensable ally, the democratic Jewish state of Israel. This bill is a reaffirmation of our staunch commitment to Israel's security, its right to self-defense, and its right to exist. It is a testament to our friendship with Israel that has served us so well for the last 64 years and will continue to serve us well for many generations to come. And it is a pledge that the United States and Israel, continuing to work together, will address the challenges to our common security so that we can ensure a safe, prosperous, and free future for both of our nations. And with that, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to yield back the balance of our time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time, and the question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 4133 as amended, and those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will say no. In opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, Madam the Speaker, rules are... Madam Speaker. Gentlelady from Florida. On that, I request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested, and all those in favor of taking this vote by the yeas and the nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Gentlelady for, from I Florida. I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn to meet at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Without objection? Thank you. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, proceedings will resume on motions to suspend the rules previously postponed, and votes will be taken in the following order. H.R. 2072, by the yeas and nays. H.R. 4133, by the yeas and nays. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote, and the remaining electronic vote will be conducted as a 5-minute vote. The unfinished business is on the vote.
is the vote on the motion of the gentleman from California, Mr. Miller, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2072 as amended, on which the yeas and nays are ordered, and the clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 2072, a bill to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank of the United States and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote, a 15-minute vote. The House is taking the first of two votes. This vote is on extending the Export-Import Bank Charter for another three years. The bill sets conditions, though. It sets lending caps, limits on default rates, and increases accountability. After this, the House will vote on a bill extending a $9 billion loan guarantee for Israel. Then, members resume debate on a bill providing $51 billion for the Commerce and Justice Departments, NASA, and other agencies next budget year. During this vote, a House Budget Committee member discusses spending negotiations underway on Capitol Hill. Members are planning to debate budget cuts later this week. Talking about that this morning, uh, looking at what it means for the Tea Party, and also looking at what it means for moderates. What do you think? Well, I think it means uh, quite a few things for Washington. I, I think it's going to send another message that uh, we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, America is still $15.8 trillion in debt, and, uh, and folks are worried. I hear that in Kansas, and I'm sure uh, they're hearing the same thing in Indiana. Folks are not worried about today. They're worried about what's happening in the future for the children and grandchildren. I think that seemed to be the main issue there, are ready to make a change to save our country. USA Today has an op-ed piece that says that Luger joins a long list of lawmakers who face the ire of their party's voters for occasionally finding common cause with the other side. And it says that he could hardly be called a moderate because he opposed many of the main uh, tenants of the Obama administration, also backs a flat consumption tax advocated by wealthy wage earners. But he has worked across party lines. What kind of a message does this send about bipartisanship? Well, I think, again, it's not about bipartisanship. This was obviously a Republican primary, and Mr. Murdoch said uh, we need a, a more conservative uh, senator in, in the United States Congress representing the state of Indiana. I'm from Kansas. I hear the same sentiment back home. Not a desire to uh, simply to get along, but actually provide some solutions and solve the problems. And after 30-some years of trying, I think it's, uh, I think Indiana said they're ready to try someone else to fix those fix those problems. And you're a member of the Tea Party Caucus here on Capitol Hill, also the Republican Study Committee. How do you define the Tea Party and, and your role in that? Because we, we certainly hear from callers that say it's more of a movement than it is an actual organization. Well, I think that's right and accurate. Uh, there's multiple groups. and but. If Essentially, at least in Kansas, where I come from, uh, Tea Party's made up folks are very concerned about the, the fact that government's bigger than ever, it's uh, more intrusive than ever, massive amounts of debt, massive amounts of spending, and seems to be out of control. And, and frankly, when we're borrowing uh, uh, $1.3 trillion every year to, to fund our overspending, I, they are right. And, uh, and there still is that concern out there, even if they aren't uh, marching in the streets every day. It's the average ordinary Americans concerned about their government. As a member of the Budget Committee, what are you looking at in terms of uh, fiscal restraint? House Republicans in this current budget paddle are looking at actually boosting defense spending, cutting back on social programs. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I think we could cut all the above. And folks uh, agree and disagree on that, uh, but we cannot disagree on the fact that uh, we can't run trillion dollar deficits uh, in perpetuity. And actually, on the president's budget, uh, he runs deficits for the next 75 years. That's unsustainable. Uh, we've got to move quickly to bring the budget in balance. Folks just have a dis differing uh, opinion of how quickly we can and should do that. I help uh, put together with other members of the Republican Study Committee a budget that would balance in five years. And, uh, but that did not pass. Uh, but, but frankly, I don't think we have five years uh, to actually fiddle around uh, while we watch Rome burning in, in, in this overspending crisis that we face right now. So what do you do with other House Republicans? How do you come to terms with your goals versus uh, what, what the party at large is pushing? Well, I'm one amongst 240 folks, and you learn pretty quickly, uh, even as a freshman, it, it takes a number of folks uh, to get the job done. It's just not one of us. 
it's a, it's a team effort, and you have to work across the party lines. But what I found in Washington, oftentimes, is there's an area of spending, the Democrat spending, and then there's the Republican spending, and they all come together, and they don't cut each other's spending. And that has been the case, I think, for many years, which is why we've had uh, some pretty large deficits, uh, massive deficits, uh, deficits under the current president, but even under the previous president, the uh, Republican president, we had some very large deficits as well. Here's a recent story from the Wall Street Journal this week. The House bill shields defense from cuts. House Republicans seeking to prevent Defense spending cuts at the end of the year advanced a plan that would instead reduce spending on health care programs, food aid, and other major domestic initiatives of the Obama administration. The bill developed by the House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan, Republican of Wisconsin, would cut about $261 billion in domestic spending over the next decade and roll back portions of the 2010 health care law and the Dodd-Frank financial overhaul. And your question about that was... Well, I, so my question would be, I don't know if sure. you just wanted to react or not, but yeah. my question would be... How do you come to terms with this defense spending protection? As you mentioned, you'd like to see everything cut. You're happy with these cuts. You're content with these cuts. Yeah. But you want to see more and deeper. Well, I think we have to roll back to the debt deal in, in August, in, in which uh, uh, the federal government was given an opportunity to borrow another $2.1 trillion. And at that time, we were promised a, 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 an amount of cuts. Uh, this is an attempt to uh, move the, the cuts around. But we still have to make those cuts. But so should sequest <coughs> sequestration be off the table? Now, I, I think it probably will need to happen because that, that is what occurred. That was the deal. And, uh, but, uh, again, the amount of cuts that would have to occur. But you know, what folks tell me they're frustrated about is that Washington was given another $2.1 trillion to spend, but not a single item has been cut yet. I mean, there's some minor things that have been cut, but the, most of the cuts, the vast majority of the cuts, won't occur until after the next election, till next year. And we're still talking about cuts next year when we have a one point whatever trillion dollar deficit this year. And that's, that's the major concern most Tea Party folks have. Most average Americans say, we can't run those deficits. We've got to do something about it. It's a spending problem, not a revenue problem. And there are plenty of ways to, to look at cuts, which is why I was sitting on the floor last night, uh, helped voting on, on cut after cut uh, that were being offered by various Republicans, particularly freshmen. Our guest is Congressman Tim Heelskamp, Republican of Kansas. He's a freshman. In addition to his service in Congress, he's also a farmer and a rancher. Let's hear from the call. Doris, the Democrat, joining us from Chicago. Go ahead, Doris. Thank you. Uh, number one, Luger was not a moderate Republican. He was a, a, a very conservative Republican. Number two, conservative Republicans cannot be trusted to keep their words. This sequence stretched the, the budget plan was supposed to be in effect. But now you guys are cutting everything. You cut the WIC nutrition program to finance your tax, cut, <clears throat> tax cuts for the rich. And you need to stop calling yourself the small government party. You folks are passing all these big government intrusive laws all over the country. You're the vaginal probe party. You're the voter suppression party. All these laws are big, intrusive government. Well, there's certainly a lot of intrusive laws, and, and myself, I've opposed uh, uh, quite a few of those, and I appreciate that concern, and that's the concern of most Americans. It, it's not about uh, a particular party. And uh, when we talk about debt in Washington, there's no Republican debt, there's no uh, Democrat debt, there's American debt, there's American problem. And that's what I hear from constituents. They want some solutions. They're tired of the bickering. That's always taken place in our country. But they, they know we have to reduce spending. And frankly, the greatest uh, issue in that is I was in the Budget Committee earlier uh, this week, I believe it was, we were debating uh, food stamps. In the last decade, there's been a 270, that's 270 percent increase in food stamp spending. We talked about reducing a small, minor percentage of that, and folks are like, well, you can't take a few percent after you raise it 270 percent. That's out of control spending. And frankly, uh, Americans cannot afford it. I, I did a, a, a polling of my constituents last night, 90 percent of constituents in Kansas that were on the phone with me says we've got to reduce spending, including food stamps, including nearly every program. That's what I tell them when I've done town hall after town hall in my district. Politico has a story this week looking at the uh, money spent by former presidents and what the taxpayers actually pay. It says Bush had an $80,000 phone bill. Taxpayers picked up the tab for Bill Clinton's $579,000 office rent and George W. Bush's $80,000 phone bill in 2010, according to a report Tuesday that notes Americans ponied up more than $3 million of expenses to the country's four surviving former presidents. 
Yeah, those are pretty expensive. Uh, it's a great example. Each of our congressional offices is given a particular budget, uh, depending on the size of our district, where we're at. And uh, I got together with uh, some of my fellow freshmen, and we refused to spend everything we were given. And I, I remember reporters said, well, that's only a few million dollars that you're going to turn back amongst these 10 freshmen. And that's not much in the, in the big picture of things. I said, if everybody in Washington would cut 10 percent, like I did in my office and, and my colleagues did, freshman colleagues, we'd finally start to get something. And, and, but millions do add up to billions and billions add up to trillions. But the point is, every day in America, we're borrowing three to four billion dollars uh, to fund this overspending and that's unsustainable and whether you're Republican or Democrat uh, we should be concerned as, as are the folks that are funding this uh, spending spree. Brandywine, Maryland, Emma, independent caller. Go ahead. Hi Emma. Emma, last Hello. try. You're on the program. Hello. Hi. Hi. This what, is, uh, what's your name? My name's Tom. Okay Tom, where are you calling from? Calling from uh, Dayton, Ohio. All right, welcome. Go ahead. You're on with Representative Hules Camp. Hi, I, I really think it's a, a mixture. We have to cut, but we also have to have revenue. Uh, I just can't see the philosophy where I'm going to go to Apple and this guy that's running Apple to make 370, uh, wait, 167 thousand dollars an hour, and he don't need tax, and he pays his employees one dollar an hour. I mean, this is crazy. Okay, so disparity among pay, what CEOs make versus the average worker? Well, you don't want Washington to actually dictating what folks get paid. And uh, we'll see what happens. We'll have the same disparity uh, or the same budget deficits we, we have now. I, I, know, I know that's a concern, but that, frankly, is, is how the system works. Uh, some folks make more, more than others. Folks that do a good job generally get rewarded, and it's the job in, in Washington, I think, is to make sure we have a level, fair playing field. But uh, the gentleman, uh, Tom, did mention the issue of taxes. I think he would hire, want higher taxes on somebody else. But the reality is 49% of Americans pay no federal income taxes. When I talk to folks in Kansas, they're like, well, if we're going to make it more fair, most folks should have to pay part of that system and, uh, and should help have to fund, fund their government. And, uh, and w the top 1%, I know the president always talks about that, they already pay 38% of all the federal income taxes, which is uh, probably the most progressive system in the world. A and the idea is somehow we're going to... Uh, get everybody to pay more or at least a certain share to pay more and meanwhile we can't cut spending in this place uh, it's a spending not a revenue not a revenue problem and, and that's how we're going to solve and, and provide a solution to our deficit crisis let's hear from a republican nick joins us from fairfax virginia close to dc go ahead nick hi good morning congressman thank you for uh, being on today really good morning um and chief Ben, thank you for the program this is some fantastic stuff um i had a question for the congressman Actually, it's, it's, it's since changed since I heard your remarks about the food stamp, so I wanted to kind of tie this in. My original question was, um, you know, you're focusing on cutting the government and cutting uh, what we see as, as waste uh, from the government or maybe just programs that we'd like to do but can't really afford to do in this type of economy. Um, what are your thoughts on the other side of that coin as far as uh, either increasing the base or increasing the tax rate um, to raise revenue, uh, and also tied with that, you talked about the um, the food stamp uh, uh, spending spending increasing by 270 percent or, or some such number. Yeah. And I wanted to ask also then, you know, that safety net is there, and to say that our spending has increased and calling that a problem, I, I see that more as more people are falling off the bridge and landing in that safety net, and that's why maybe the spending is increasing as opposed to. The, the program itself is out of control. I wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, Nick, I appreciate that. There's a few things that uh, certainly in the Obama economy, it's uh, the weakest economic recovery, uh, I believe, since the Great Depression. The average uh, wait for Americans in the Obama economy to find a new job is 39 weeks. If you were to start today, if a college graduate were to start today, it'd be uh, Valentine's Day next year before they would find a job on average. I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, a very, very weak e economy. But uh, the figure I gave about a 270 percent increase in food stamps. At the same time, during that 10-year period, we had 19 million Americans on food stamps 10 years ago. Today, we have over 44 million Americans on the food stamps. Part of it's because the, the economy is so poor under the President Obama. The other part of it is, during the stimulus package, there was a huge in increase in expansion of the program. And so there, it's, it's multiple parts, as Nick has mentioned. But he asked a question about raising revenue. If nothing changes in Washington, current law would 
mean that we will have the single largest tax increase in our entire history will take place at the end of this year. All the Bush Obama tax cuts will expire. We will have higher death taxes. We will have higher marginal income taxes. We will have higher capital gains rates. And so for the folks out there that are looking for a tax increase, including the president, if nothing happens in Washington, we will have the biggest tax increase, which will be devastating to our economy. And I'm very concerned about that in particular because it seems uh, neither party has a real workable plan to avoid this tax increase cliff that's coming at the end of the year. So I come back to this question of how do you as a freshman make some inroads? How do you go back to voters uh, as you run for re-election this fall and mm -hmm. say, okay, well my party may not be supporting everything that I want, but I'm still, what? I, I, there's prospects for change. There's How do you convince them that, that your message and your point can make a difference here in Washington? Well, in the last year and a half, I've done uh, 119 town halls in the district, and, uh, which is unusual, the numbers of those. But uh, what I tell folks is Washington uh, really makes me depressed <laughs> when you see what's happening up here, the spending that never seems to change. But when I go home and see the American people, at least the folks in Kansas, that's why I'm optimistic. It isn't Washington that's going to solve our problems. It's called elections and the American people getting engaged. That's always how it's been solved. Usually it's Washington that follows the rest of America, and I think that's the case today. The American people get it. They know we're in a spending problem. And I also talk about the 40% rule. And they say, well, what's the 40% rule? Well, it's the rule that every dime we spend in Washington today, 40% of that's borrowed. That means for every amount we spend today, our children and grandchildren are going to pay 40% of that off sometime in the future. That's a huge threshold. It's unsustainable, and, and we need more revenues, but we do that by growing the economy. The Republican plan that, that passed, which I do support in part, is uh, we'd have a uh, two tax rate, we'd flatten the system, remove most of the special interest loopholes, and that way we can focus on most Americans pay the rates and get on with doing their business. I think that would grow the economy, create more revenue just by flattening the tax code. Congressman Tim Heelskamp, Republican of Kansas. Let's hear from Patty, who's a Democrat in Sterling, Virginia. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I guess I'd like to start my comments off with um, this congressman has his rhetoric uh, practiced well, but this is not the Obama economy. That's the first point I'd like to make. This is the result of eight, you know, almost eight full years of Republican control of both the executive and legislative branches. And instead of the uh, listening to a prominent Princeton economist, who I believe is a Nobel Prize winner, Paul Krugman, whose basic point is we can't cut our way into growth, these Tea Party activists think they know better, think that, you know, this major whiplash reaction to what the Bush administration brought us to, which was, as we've said many, many times, the brink of the worst, you know, economic crisis since the Depression, which President Obama has worked furiously to keep us from, from you know, snapping back there while he's trying to deal with this reactionary Congress that says, just cut, 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 and somehow that's going to stimulate the economy. And one more point, the defense budget, which the Republicans consistently protect, and I worked in the Pentagon for 20 years. I know intimately it is the biggest stimulus package this country, this world has ever known. And they never, they never acknowledge that. And it's ridiculous. Patty, we'll get a response from our guest. But first, I'm sure you've noticed that we are going to have Paul Krugman on later on this morning. He'll be joining us uh, in about 45 minutes or so, uh, half an hour actually. So you can stay tuned to hear him. Uh, Congressman Hulskamp, how do you react to, to Patty's concerns both about whose fault it is and then about uh, defense spending being essentially a stimulus. Well, I, I think Patty knows the president has been Barack Obama for over three years. I mean, when is it someone else's fault? And uh, you know, trying to determine fault uh, oftentimes doesn't work. I've got uh, a number of teenage kids and, and younger kids, and everybody wants to blame each other. But the point is, President Obama has been president for over three years. On the first day of his presidency, for example, the price of gasoline was $1.89. Look at what we're paying today, 3 and $4 in this particular area. The deficit was well below half of what it is today. This is the only president in history who's run trillion-dollar deficits. He's run it for four straight years. And uh, I would love to hear what Mr. Krugman says uh, about uh, economics because he was dead wrong on the stimulus. They promised us if we borrowed over $800 billion in the stimulus package that our unemployment rate would never be below 8%. Here we are, I think, after what, uh, how many years later? It's still above 8%, and we have another 
$800 billion in debt with interest, $1.1 trillion. It's time to quit blaming folks. It's time for this president and his supporters to say their policies have failed. And hopefully that in this uh, debate uh, during the presidential campaign, we're focused on the fact that the president's policies have failed. It doesn't work to borrow and spend our way to prosperity, even though liberal economists suggest that would work. It did not work. It was a massive failure. It's very clear from the numbers. Let's look at the unemployment numbers, both nationally and in your home state of Kansas. Uh, nationally, it's 8.1 percent. And then in Kansas, where our guest hails from, it's 6.1 percent. We're getting those numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Daniel writes in on Twitter and asks whether you'd be willing to stop all tax breaks for millionaires and people richer than millionaires. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think anybody needs to pay more in taxes until we get our spending under control. The last time Washington actually reduced its spending year to year, the last time was before Elvis's first album. Americans have a right to be skeptical because it seems the Republicans talk they're gonna, like they're going to cut spending and the Democrats say they're going to cut spending. And then you look at the facts. Is Again, it's been decades since we actually cut spending year to year. But if you hear the rhetoric in, in this town, boy, there's massive spending cuts. Actually, they're usually talking about cutting the rate of growth in spending. And, and frankly, when we're borrowing a trillion dollars a year plus, and we've done four years in a round of this president, that's unsustainable. It's doing long-term damage to our economy. Our guest, Representative Hills Camp, is on the Budget Committee, and we mentioned this story from the Wall Street Journal looking at House Republicans, how they want to prevent defense spending cuts. They'll have advanced a plan in the Budget Committee that would instead reduce spending on health care programs, food aid, and other major domestic initiatives of the Obama administration. Well, the ranking Democrat on your committee pushed back, Chris Van Hollen, Democrat of Maryland. Let's hear what he had to say. The plan before us is flawed for several reasons. First, it is only for one year, and even then, it doesn't totally remove the sequester. It lifts the sequester for discretionary spending, but leaves it in place for all mandatory spending except defense. As a result, it keeps the 2% across the board cut in Medicare, for example. Second, it continues the lopsided approach of the full Republican budget, protecting those special interest tax breaks at the expense of vital safety net programs. What do you think of Congressman Van Hollen's comments? Well, they're typical partisan comments. I understand that. Uh, but uh, folks always say, well, golly, gee, you can't cut my spending. And I, I would just like to try it once in Washington because uh, it, I support uh, more cuts in defense than many of my Republican colleagues. Uh, but what I also support is actually looking at uh, waste and, and food stamps and uh, all the growth and stimulus spending. And uh, the general Republican approach in the House has been back to, been to roll back spending to pre-stimulus levels. Most Americans said 2008 spending, 2007 spending, that was big enough already. And the idea that we can't roll back to a few years ago, the idea we can't cut 10 percent after growing food stamps by 270 percent. We can't afford 260 percent growth in food stamps. And again, it's that 40 percent rule that Mr. Van Hollen and, and others like us to forget is we are burdening our children and grandchildren the idea that they're the ones that are going to pay for this spending. And I, I just had a, a conversation on Skype with some fourth and fifth graders in Emporia, Kansas. And a young, uh, young man asked me, I probably came from his parents, he said, well, why are our taxes always seem to be going up? Because our spending, I said, see, keeps going up. And even our, our taxes are higher, our spending is higher, and the end result is our economy is moving slower. Spartanburg, South Carolina.
The yeas are 330 and the nays are 93. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The unfinished business is the vote on the motion of the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Ross Layton, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 4133 as amended, on which the A's and nays are ordered, and the clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 4133. A bill to express the sense of Congress regarding the United States-Israel strategic relationship to direct the President to submit to Congress reports on United States actions to enhance this relationship and to assist in the defense of Israel and for other purposes. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device and this will be a five-minute vote. A five-minute vote. The House is voting on a bill extending a $9 billion loan guarantee for Israel. After this vote, members resume debate on a bill providing $51 billion for the Commerce and Justice Departments, NASA, and other agencies next budget year. While this vote on Israel policy is underway, a look at deliberations today off the House floor on defense programs. Joining us this morning is Frank Oliveri of CQ to uh, talk about what's going on as the uh, defense authorization debate is about to get underway. Frank, this morning the Republican uh, defense budget is higher than the White House proposal. Now at the same time we've got the automatic budget sequester spending cuts that are starting in January and that would take what uh, Defense Secretary Panetta called a meat axe approach to defense savings. How might members reconcile this? Well, you know, it's an interesting situation because essentially in the House they're ignoring the BCA uh, and uh, basically setting aside for defense about $8 billion more than the BCA would permit. Uh, and, you know, it's going to come down to a, a, a discussion between the Senate and the House at some point, uh, the, the conferees, as to, to reconcile these differences. Um, it's uh, in, in the House, if you don't meet the caps, on the defense side, uh, that means that it's going to put more pressure on the domestic side, as we saw in the Ryan uh, budget, budget resolution. A lot of the uh, cuts that he is suggesting uh, would happen on domestic discretionary spending. Now, the White House has called for closing of more military bases and increasing health care fees for military retirees. The, the military bases issue apparently is not an item now, but can we expect the committee to support the president on increasing the health fees for retirees? Uh, no, I, I think that you're going to see resistance almost uh, across the Congress to those fees. Uh, you know, you have uh, Chairman Wilson, uh, uh, personnel subcommittee here on the HASC, who was opposed to it on the on the Senate side. You had Senator Webb also opposed to these fee increases on uh, military retirees. Uh, so there's not a lot of support here for them. Now, that does create a gap here uh, in the HASC bill, uh, the Defense Authorization Bill here in the House Armed Services Committee. And uh, what they've chosen to do is to try to reconcile that whole by making other reductions in mandatory spending. There is a debate about missile defense. California mm -hmm. Congressman John Garamendi, who is a member of the Armed Services Committee, said that he would cut from the bill. There's a provision that would require Defense Secretary Panetta to ensure that a U.S.-based facility with anti-intercontinental ballistic missiles interceptors is uh, operational by the end of December 2015. Mm -hmm. It's targeted at missiles coming from Iran. How much politics is behind a missile defense shield on the East Coast, and do you think this will stay in the proposal? Uh, I think I think it's going to stay here in the House. Uh, I, I I don't think the Democrats have enough votes to to undercut that, and uh, and I don't think they'll be able to get it done on the floor either. But I don't think it'll. I think it'd be a very difficult uh, sell in the Senate. So that's going to be a negotiating point. Uh, but it's a you know from from the polit political side of things. You know, uh, I talked to Mr. Jeremy yesterday, and one of the things that he told me was that you know he felt uh, that this was an attempt uh, to create a national security problem for the president. Uh, Republicans have been looking for some time ways to uh, challenge uh, the Democratic president on national security. Uh, this president, because of the bin Laden slaying, because of some of his foreign policy uh, decisions and the Libya war and so on and so forth, has had some success on that front. Uh, but uh, if, if uh, Congressman Turner, who was the one who pushed for this uh, in, his, uh, in his portion of this 
this bill as the chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Uh, I think that the, he is trying to expose, at least this is from the Democrats' perspective, uh, trying to expose the president on national security and saying, we want to put an, an, um, a missile uh, battery here on the East Coast to protect America from these missiles. Uh, and the president won't support this. Um, Mr. Garamendi and also I spoke to Loretta Sanchez yesterday, each have cited this as a, as a, a missile battery, a, a missile defense battery that isn't really necessary at this point. Uh, they argue that the Iranians first don't have a nuclear weapon, and second, the Iranians don't have an ICBM at this point, and uh, you know, it's going to cost $100 million uh, this year if they get this into the bill to do a study on this type of thing, and then to guarantee the, the construction of this thing uh, would lead to billions and billions more in expenses. You know, we've already seen that uh, the Defense Department's got a car about about $490 billion over the next 10 years out of their future planning, uh, they could face another $500 billion if they can't reconcile and deal with the sequester that's coming. Uh, so this would add a great deal more uh, expense to the Pentagon over the next 10 years if they were to take this route. And we'll have to end it there. Frank Oliveri is with Congressional Quarterly. Thanks for your time. Hey, my pleasure. On this vote, the yeas are 411, the nays are 2, 9 recorded as present. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The House will be in order. Members, please vacate the well. And who are we going to go with? Does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on the Judiciary be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 4967 and ask for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 4967, a bill to prevent the termination of the temporary office of bankruptcy judges in certain judicial districts. Is there objection to the consideration of the bill? Without objection, the bill is engrossed, read a third time and passed, and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. So what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days and want to revise and extend the remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 5326 and I may include tabular material on the same.
Without objection, so ordered. What purpose does the gentleman from Utah rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have a, uh, an amendment at the desk. The gentleman will suspend. Pursuant to House Resolution 643 and Rule 18, the chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 5326. Will the gentlelady from Michigan, Mrs. Miller, kindly resume the chair? The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 5326, which the clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for the Departments of Commerce and Justice, Science and Related Agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole rose earlier today, the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Sutherland, had been disposed of, and the bill had been read through page 101, line 10. Gentleman from Utah. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The House is not in order. Gentleman's correct. The House is not in order. The House will be in order. The House will come to order. The committee will be in order. Gentleman from Utah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the amendment that we offer today is a strike. Gentlemen, well suspend. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act may be used in contravention of paragraph 1, 2, or 3 of section 1001A of Title 18, United States Code. Gentlemen from Utah for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. One of the deep concerns that we have is uh, the investigation in Fast and Furious. We have to remember that, uh, unfortunately, we lost one of our Border Patrol agents who was out on, on a patrol serving this nation. He was killed with weapons that were distributed under a program called Fast and Furious. This is a sad case of government gone awry, making terrible, awful, deadly decisions. The administration knowingly and willingly allowing guns to walk from gun shops, con contrary to what uh, U.S. law is, allowing nearly 2,000 weapons to be released out, knowing that these weapons would be given to the cartels, the drug cartels, knowing to giving these guns to, to these very nefarious characters with the hope that maybe they would pop up and we'd find out who's using these guns. Well, there are tragic, desperate consequences to what was happening. What should be totally unacceptable on both sides of the aisle is the idea and the notion that the Department of Justice would knowingly and willfully lie to Congress. Senator Grassley had presented the Department of Justice a letter directly to Attorney General Holder. And Attorney General Holder, Madam Chair, the, the House is not in order. Uh, the gentleman is correct. The House is not in order. The committee will be in order. And members are advised to take their conversation off the floor. Members and staff are advised to take their conversation off the floor, and the committee will be in order. Gentleman from Utah. Senator Grassley directly gave to Attorney General Holder a concern expressed in a letter that there were guns walking. It's a term, it's an expression that says we allow people to come in under straw purchasing, which is illegal, to buy guns and weapons for somebody else. And that despite what the ATF and the Department of Justice were doing, they weren't tracking these. They allowed these gun purchases to happen in these gun shops, and then they were let out in the greater Arizona area and allowed these guns to walk. The consequences have been absolutely tragic. We have a dead border patrol agent. The Mexican government estimates nearly 300 people have died within Mexico. Very few of these weapons have been recovered. In fact, the Attorney General has testified that there will be crimes committed with these weapons in all likelihood for years to come. What is totally and wholly unacceptable, I think, to this body and the integrity, despite Republicans and Democrats, is that the Department of Justice would knowingly and willfully present a letter back to Congress on February 4th that was so inaccurate, it was so wrong, essentially they lied to Congress. And it took months and months and months and months to get to the point where they finally had to rescind that letter. 
Well, they had to admit that this was a fundamentally flawed program at its very core. Now, we've been seeking documents, we've been seeking information, we've issued subpoenas, we've been patient beyond belief, but we've mostly been stonewalled. That information has not been forthcoming. What this amendment simply says is that they will not be able to allow to be able to use federal funds, taxpayer dollars, to knowingly, willfully skirt the law and lie to Congress. Now, on February 4th, I want to remind members, J February 4th, 2011, the Department of Justice lied to Congress about the tactics used in Fast and Furious by claiming federal authorities make, quote, every effort to interdict weapons that have been purchased illegally and prevent their transportation to Mexico, end quote. And they denied the allegations the Department facilitated an illegal sale of guns to Mexican drug cartels. But December 2, 2011, the Department of Justice formally withdrew the February letter because it was filled with misleading, fictitious, and false statements. The December letter later went on to admit the Fast and Furious was, quote, fundamentally flawed operation. What we're saying is you should not be able to use taxpayer funds to knowingly and willfully subvert Congress. You can't lie to Congress and use taxpayer dollars to do it. Surely that can be bipartisan in its approach. All we ask is for the truth. In fact, there were more than a dozen, in fact, more than two dozen members of the Democratic Party serving in Congress who sent a letter to the White House expressing the idea and the notion that the, the administration should be open and forthright in, in providing this information to Congress. But it has not been forthcoming. It has not been accurate. It has, in fact, it was a lie. As we look to Brian Terry, who served this country, we owe it to him and to his family to get to the truth of what happened in Fast and Furious. And no taxpayer dollars should ever be used to knowingly, willfully lie to Congress. We as a body, as an institution, deserve to get to the bottom of this. We have not had all these answers. And on March 25th, March 25th of 2011, President Obama stood before, uh, in an interview, and told the world that they would hold somebody responsible, that Eric Holder wasn't, wasn't responsible for this, and that they would hold somebody responsible and make sure that it doesn't happen again. To date, Madam Chair, that has not happened. In fact, the senior management there at the Department of Justice got promotions. Some of them got bonuses. Nobody's been fired at the senior levels over there. And we're not just looking for somebody to get fired. We've got to make sure that it never, ever happens again. And so I would encourage members to, to support this amendment. We should do so in a bipartisan way and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, I rise to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, there's nothing in the gentleman's amendment uh, that I think anyone could disagree with. Uh, the, the amendment doesn't speak about Attorney General Holder. It doesn't speak about any particular uh, matter uh, that's been referenced in the uh, comments on, on the floor. It just says that you can't use dollars as provided under this act to give misinformation to the Congress. I think every member should support this. I think, however, I want to, and I think many members would separate themselves from these accusations that are baseless. In fact, they've been investigated, and there's no evidence that the Attorney General uh, provided any misinformation to the Congress. In fact, he's testified seven times. He's provided thousands of documents. And what we do know is that this Congress, under Republican control and a Republican administration, started endeavors to track illegal guns that were very similar to the operation that's been referred to. And some of those guns fell into the wrong hands. But to attack federal law enforcement that's trying to catch bad guys, who are operating sting operations, even when they go poorly. I think it's just a wrong place for uh, federal lawmakers to be. I'm in support of federal law enforcement, and even if their policies in this particular way uh, were wrong and they've been corrected, that is, in fact, once the Attorney General knew about it, he stopped it. Everyone in the line of responsibility here, those have been removed. So when the gentleman suggests on the floor of the House that no one's lost their job, no one's been changed, that's entirely inaccurate. But I do want to make this point, is that we should be in support of federal law enforcement. We should support them and to attack career ATF agents who are, trying, who are risking their lives 
trying to catch bad guys along the border. Uh, I think it's the wrong way for us to proceed just because we want to go at this administration. Now, if there's an election in which there's a change in presidency, the other side will get a chance to uh, name an attorney general. Under our Constitution, the attorney general serves at the pleasure of the president. And the president has made it clear that Attorney General Holder, and I think in many people's minds, uh, is one of the best that's ever served in this position. And regardless of what you think about the political appointees in the department, to attack career ATF agents for doing their job while they risk their lives on behalf of American citizens, I think it's the wrong thing to do. But I support the amendment. There's nothing in this amendment at all connected to these uh, baseless allegations, none of which have been proved. And I think it's wrong to come to the House, defame public servants, say that they've lied to the Congress, uh, when in fact there's nothing in the record that suggests that whatsoever. So with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Virginia. Uh, strike the record with a number of words. The gentleman is recognized for five uh, minutes. I rise in support of the amendment. I think truthfulness and accuracy are essential components of any oversight process. And the amendment simply requires the Justice Department and all federal agencies funded by this bill provide only forthright and truthful statements and representations. And with that, I ask for a yay vote and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from South Carolina. Move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I was not going to talk because I talked yesterday on Fast and Furious, and Representative Chaffetz did a wonderful job. But, Madam Chairwoman, I cannot stand here while demonstrably false insinuations are leveled. I worked for the Department of Justice for six years. I worked with ATF for 16 years. I'll put the respect that I have for federal law enforcement and federal prosecutors up against anybody in this body. It may well be that the documents we haven't gotten clear all the senior DOJ officials. How will we possibly know that if he continues to withhold documents? So, Madam Chairwoman, let me just ask this. To the average citizen who gets a grand jury subpoena, or a subpoena for documents, or to compel the presence, what would happen if they ignored it? Madam Chairwoman, what would happen if you got a jury summons and you just decided you weren't going to show up? What would happen to the average citizen if they got a subpoena from a congressional committee and they just decided to ignore it? And their defense was, well, we gave you some documents. There are 70,000-something documents that the Inspector General has. We have one-twelfth of that. There are entire categories of documents that we do not have. We do not have a single email from the Attorney General of the United States after February the 4th, 2011. I want you to ask yourself how many emails you have sent and received today. And the number is zero from February the 4th, 2011 until present. And Congressman Chaffetz is exactly right. There was a demonstrably false letter sent to a member of Congress. And then the Department of Justice, that I actually value its reputation. We have to have a Department of Justice that people respect. But the Department of Justice took the unprecedented step of having to withdraw a letter sent to a member of Congress because it was demonstrably false. On February the 4th, 2011, the Department of Justice, on Department of Justice letterhead, mails a demonstrably false letter denying a tactic called gun walking. On the very same day, the criminal chief of the Department of Justice of the United States of America is in Mexico advocating for the tactic of gun walking. And somehow we can't ask the Department of Justice to tell us who knew what when. And the gentleman on the other side of the aisle, Madam Chairwoman, said everyone has been punished. Madam Chairwoman, no one has been punished. There hasn't been a demotion. There hasn't been a firing. There hasn't been a sanction. There hasn't been a frowny face on a performance evaluation. 
There's been nothing. So I will say what I said yesterday, Madam Chairwoman. This is not just another department in someone's cabinet. This isn't just some other political appointee. This is the Attorney General for the United States of America. It is the Department of Justice. If they cannot comply with a lawfully executed subpoena, then there should be sanctions just like there would be for me or you. So I urge support for Representative Chaffetz's amendment. Gentleman yields back his time. Yes, ma'am. Gentleman from Texas. Move to strike the last word. And the gentleman from Texas recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I rise in support of this amendment because I'm seeing what I consider to be an alarming trend in government right now. We have Eric Holder in Fast and Furious, the Justice Department failing to cooperate with multiple committees of this Congress. Right now, as we speak, there's a hearing going on in the Government Oversight and Reform Committee with the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, with the TSA potentially having misled Congress over the waste and abuse of uh, dollars warehousing security equipment in Dallas, Texas. We're standing here today while whistleblowers who are trying to do what's right for this government are being retaliated against. We're standing here today while families like those of Agent Brian Terry, who is a victim of the Fast and Furious scandal, Agent Jaime Zapata, a constituent of mine uh, who was killed in the line of duty in Mexico, and the families of many Mexican uh, uh, citizens who were killed as a result of these gun-running operations with these weapons. This is an alarming trend in government that we have got to get put a stop to. We do not need to be financing government agencies, our employees, the people's employees. We do not need to be paying them to stall, to lie, to mislead. It is absolutely unacceptable. In the private sector, when an employee acts this way, we have a real quick solution. We quit paying them and we fire them. Unfortunately, it's a little more complicated here in the government, especially when you get to a cabinet-level official. Yes, we have our uh, remedies. We have contempt of Congress. We have criminal prosecution. And in the case of a cabinet-level official like Mr. Holder, it could eventually get to impeachment, depending on what we find out. The Constitution provides the ultimate remedy there. But there is the lifeblood of the federal bureaucracy is money. We have got to cut off the money to the employees like Eric Holder who stonewall at best and lie more likely. We need government officials who own up to their mistakes. You know, my colleague here, Mr. Gowdy, was talking about the fact there's not a single email after a certain date for Mr. Holder. I'd like to remind the chair and the American people that what gets you in this country nine times out of ten is the cover-up. The American people are willing to live with a mistake, but they are not willing to live with a liar. And this amendment cuts off funding to the liars in our federal government. So I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Madam Chair, I rise to strike the last word. Uh, Gentleman is recognized. You know, I'm from Arizona, and I am proud to, to rise in support of this amendment because no other state has suffered the consequences like we have in Arizona and will continue to. Let's think of the ramifications of what transpired here. We did not follow proper protocol in allowing guns to walk. We didn't even know where they were. And we still don't know where they are. And yet, Arizona will suffer the consequences of those guns on our side of the border. And let's take a look at the other aspect. What about the Mexican people? Where is the outcry? Where is the justice? Here we've had the Hispanic people who have lost over 300 people to this, to this uh, uh, impropriety. And it was oversight by the, by the federal government and the Department of Justice. This is outrageous. I am glad that what we're doing is defunding this aspect to make sure that we know what's right and wrong and hold people accountable for the cover-up that occurs. But think about it. Have we ever seen something of this atrocity? We've actually overstepped our, 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 the oversight and sovereignty of the Mexican government. What we need is we need answers. The American people need the answers. The, the, the folks from Arizona need the answers, and we want to make sure that those that were accountable are held perfectly to that standard, like everybody else. Yes, we have not seen the documentation. 
The other side says that oh, we have seen the documentation and, the, and everybody's been held accountable. That's wrong. Absolutely wrong. Take it from somebody from Arizona who's had to live under this Department of Justice. We want to make sure that we have accountability. And last but not least, what about the Brian Terry family? When we look at this whole oversight of this egregious operation, did it have to take the life of, of, of a brave soldier, Brian Terry? That's what it took to even come to this situation. It cannot be repeated. Absolutely, it cannot be repeated. And I'm glad that my colleague has offered this amendment to make sure that we do not get funding for those that are in the Department of Justice. And if they do, they're held to the letter of the law. I yield back to the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from South Carolina. For what purposes, gentleman rise? Move to strike last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes.